All right. Oh, fuck. gotta record it too. That would have been bad. Hundreds of millions of years ago, after an extinction wiped out many of the strange creatures in the Cambrian period, a new wave of animal diversity was about to unfold. It was the beginning of the Ordovician period, which lasted from 488 to 443 million years ago. There's a chance you've never heard of this period. It kinda lives in the shadow of the Cambrian, but it absolutely shouldn't. Because the Ordovician began with an explosion of diversity on its own and ended with one of the most catastrophic mass extinctions the world ever saw, wiping out 85% of life on Earth. This period was filled with unusual forms and the beginnings of major players that still exist today, but is somehow forgotten in mainstream media or whatever exists of mainstream media on the prehistoric world. Today, I'm gonna be introducing you to this forgotten period, its explosive beginnings, the species that shaped it and the disaster that brought it to an end. My name is Lindsay Nicole, and this is the history of life on Earth that we know of. You might've seen, the merch is finally out and I am absolutely stoked with how it came out. It's called the That We Know of Collection, featuring two shirts, one of them with the geologic time scale on the back, this one with a two-headed snake on the back, which is cool as fuck, and a smile on hoodie, which has facts and cool pictures on it. I don't know if it's like weird to wear your own merch, but I wanted to make stuff that I would wear and I've been wearing all of it constantly. It's all comfy as fuck. The shirts are really soft. I don't know if you can tell. And the hoodie is really cozy, but still like cool to wear outside, you know? Like a lot of hoodies are really comfortable and super cozy, but you can't wear them outside because you just look unkept. But this one is like the best of both worlds. And that is exactly what I wanted. And I'm just stoked with how it turned out. So I highly recommend checking them out. You can get them at my Shopify site that I will link in the description. And I'm working on connecting the shop to the YouTube channel because I know that you can do that, but I can't figure it out. So I'm working on that because it'll make it easier. Maybe I'll have it figured out by the time this video comes out. Maybe I won't, but whatever the case, make sure to check them out. And if you do end up getting stuff, please send me pictures because it would make me really happy. All right, on to what the world looked like during the Ordovician. Just like in the Cambrian, most of the Northern Hemisphere was submerged underwater, with the supercontinent Gondwana and other land masses taking up the majority of the Southern Hemisphere. And throughout this period, Gondwana started shifting towards the South Pole and eventually made it there. Remember that for later. Near the beginning of this period, the global climate was generally warmer. The atmosphere was generally moist. Ugh. And during this time, a diversification event was taking place that was essentially the Cambrian Explosion too, just 50 million years later. Only this time, it was called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. What the fuck is that? The Ordovician period needs a PR campaign because that mouthful is not gonna make anyone wanna learn anything. Matter of fact, I bet it has people making a run for it. Despite the tepid name, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification, Despite the tepid name, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event was a big smoking hot deal. Animals were diversifying at an insane rate, replacing the Cambrian forms that the world once knew with more familiar lineages that we have today. Like the Cambrian explosion, this new diversity meant new ecological roles and complexity, exploring new habitats. Plankton were the hot new thing. So many adapted to get a slice of that. Life cycles started becoming more complex. A lot of invertebrate life cycles started in the water column as larvae or hatchlings making up a pretty good portion of the world's plankton. Plankton made the transition to land, starting off as small, non-vascular little guys. No stems, no nothing, just mosses and liverwort type builds. Before they had arrived, the terrestrial world just knew bacteria and fungi. So they were about to fuck shit up. Whether or not animals started to explore land during this time is still very much up in the air. There's some shaky evidence of potential animal tracks belonging to some sort of millipede or worm, but nothing super solid yet that we know of. Regardless, the oceans were popping off. Reef communities were starting to develop and many corals, clams, and snails started appearing for the first time. Horseshoe crabs came into the mix and crinoids and cephalopods were establishing themselves and diversifying. Remember back in the Cambrian period, vertebrates were starting to develop with hyquichthys and pachyia type shit. So what were the fishies up to now? Let's start off with my favorite. Feast your eyes on Sacaban Baspis, a tiny jawless and armored fish that lived about 470 to 450 million years ago. The armor was some cool new shit that a specific group of fishes, the Arandaspids, were starting to develop. Sacaban Baspis is one of the best known and oldest Arandaspids that we know of. They're about 10 inches long and kind of looked like tadpoles due to their flat body, massive head, and lack of fins, and their armor covered their entire body. Their head was encased in a shield of bony plates, and down their body, they had these rows of scoots, 
these stone looking pieces that some animals have today, like turtles on their shell have them, birds have them on their feet, crocodilians, etc. This helped them have a fighting chance against some of the pretty heinous predators of this period that we'll get to in a bit. Another unusual thing about Sacabambaspis was their front facing eyes. It really makes them stand out against your average fish. and also makes them look cute as fuck. I mean, this face, this face is ridiculous. And if you've been following me for a while, you know I love this fish. I even named one of my Patreon tiers after it. Da -da -da -da. Shameless plug, Sacabam Baspis was not a very graceful swimmer since they had no fins to stabilize them. Looked like tadpoles and moved like tadpoles. But Sacabam Baspis displays some of the earliest evidence of a lateral line, which is a big deal for fishes. It's a sensory organ that fishes have today that runs down their body that detects movement in the water. It's what makes schools of fish so graceful, not bumping into each other or anything. Serious stuff. How about that tiny ass mouth? Like I had mentioned in the last episode, jaws hadn't evolved yet. We still don't have jaws. So they likely fed on the seabed, sucking up little bottom dwelling organisms or maybe organic matter on the seafloor. Not much else they could do that we know of. Some other fishes dealt with this lack of jaws in a different way with some weird ass fucking mouse. These are the conodonts, a group of eel-like jawless fish that are thought to be related to hagfish today. Checks out. The conodonts were a really successful group. They were found in oceans all over the world up until the Jurassic. So their fossils have been found all around the world as well. Originally, they were only known from their teeth, first discovered in the 1850s, which were more unusual than most. So scientists had a tough time placing the teeth into what animal group they belong to, maybe some sort of worm or mollusk. But then in 1983, a group of extremely well-preserved fossils placed them in the fish based on soft tissue found around these teeth elements. It showed an eel-like body, a notochord, remember from last time, the vertebrate trait, and some tweaky ass eyes. And of course, the teeth were in their mouth, but also down their throat. Absolutely vicious. Possibly used to grip and slice their prey, but also maybe used for a more innocent lifestyle of filtering plankton. Whatever they were doing worked really well for them. Obviously, they were around until the Jurassic. That is like 300 million years. So their shit was nice. Let me show you one in particular. Pandaritus. Clearly there's a lot to take in here and no offense to them, I say this in the most scientific way possible. This is some of the most heinous shit I have ever seen in my entire life. I will say this is a life restoration done by paleo artist Prehistorica based on a specific conodont specimen described in this paper. It seems like there needs to be some revisions to place the teeth more inside the mouth to resemble hagfish more, but the arrangement is heinous nonetheless. This is actually not even my point of bringing up Pandaritus. So let me get back to that. Species in this genus display evidence of being Venomous. Some fossil specimens of the teeth have found little grooves inside of the teeth, which indicate they might have had venom, which if true, this means these would be the earliest venomous animals that we know of. So good for the jawless fish. No jaws, no problem. Moving on to our beloved trilobites. The Ordovician was their bread and butter. They were doing all sorts of cool shit and diversified much more than their relatives in the Cambrian. They had all sorts of new spines and weapons as defense against the new predators. Some trilobites even evolved a shovel-like snout to dig through the sediment. Some started swimming, some developed eye stalks, and some decided they didn't need eyes anymore at all. Figuratively speaking, I realize I, I speak like that sometimes, making it sound like animals are choosing their evolution. Obviously they're not, it's just, Fun to talk that way, but I figured I'd clarify. We're just having fun here, having a good time. Another thing the trilobites did, the armadillo roll or the pangolin roll, the ability to roll and lock into a ball. The lock and roll, if you will. A defense mechanism against predators or other threatening triggers. Quick little sidebar, and I swear this circles back. I visited a pangolin rehabilitation center in Namibia back in 2019 called Rest, and the woman who runs it and studies pangolins named Maria told me a lot of what we know about the behavior of pangolins and their lifestyle is just a guess because they're unbelievably difficult to study. The second they're even a little bit stressed, they roll up into a ball and there is no getting them out of it. They will die that way if they have to. And so it seems like the trilobites had a similar perspective on life. A lot of trilobite fossils are often found in that lock and roll position, which honestly, valid. The Ordovician also saw the biggest trilobite species that we know of, Isotelus rex. One of their complete fossils is 28 inches long. So like I said, the Ordovician was the trilobite's prime time. This was their Super Bowl. All right, that takes care of more of the familiar faces of the Ordovician. Let's move on to the stranger side, starting off with two that look like Cambrian leftovers. Here's the first one. Enjoy this picture while I figure out how to pronounce it again. Me, mir, mir, Mir Six and a half hours later. Miri Theorin. You're probably thinking that can't be the case. Well, 
read it and weep. This animal was found in Wales in the UK, and to honor that, the scientists who discovered it used the Welsh language to construct the scientific name. And the double D in Welsh is the TH sound. So it's Mirithirin. It translates to bramble snout. Bramble, which is apparently in reference to the animal's spiky proboscis. I looked it up because I thought there is no way that word is not some sort of British chicken scratch. But according to the Cambridge Dictionary, a bramble is a wild bush with thorns. I don't want to call it either of those things. I don't want to keep saying Mirithirin, and I don't want to call it bramble snout, so let's just call it Binks. No reason to make this any harder than it needs to be. If you watch the first episode of this series, you might be thinking that Binks is some sort of leftover version of Opabinia, which is pretty surprising because Opabinia was a lone wolf in the abyss of taxonomy for over a hundred years, up until last year when Uterora was found to be Opabinia's relative from the same time. Turns out the day that Uterora paper was published, the lead scientist of the paper named Joanna Wolf saw a picture of Binks and was like, no fucking way. There's a third one. Would you believe the luck of that? Whether or not Binks was related to Opabinia is still a mystery. They have plenty of similarities. The proboscis, a backwards facing mouth, legs underneath the undulating body flaps. But Binks was alive 40 million years after Opabinia and had zero eyes instead of five. This is still practically breaking news. It was only published a year ago, so I will keep you updated. The next Cambrian leftover in our lineup is a gyrocassis. Absolutely grotesque. At about seven feet long, they were some of the largest animals in the Ordovician period, and one of the largest arthropods to ever exist that we know of, the Ordovician blimp, if you will. Let's go over whatever you could call this body plan. Like other arthropods, their bodies were segmented. Each body segment carried with it two sets of flaps to move themselves through the water. They also had frontal spines that carried some weird sort of mesh that seems to have been for filtering plankton. This, along with the fact that they were very big for this time period and the abundance of their fossils, have led scientists to assume that plankton was popping off in the Ordovician due to the great Ordovician biodiver- <clears throat> Due to the great Ordovician biodiver- Language. Biodiversification. Due to the great Ordovician biodiversification event. <clears throat> God. Today, hundreds of millions of years later, we may take plankton for granted. It's just there all the time, everywhere, and so small. But the explosion of plankton was a big deal for marine ecosystems. It opened up a whole new lifestyle and body style, large and slow moving. Plankton is an all you can eat buffet everywhere. No need to be fast or maneuverable. Take your time, kick your feet back, exchange pleasantries and good natured conversation. Get as big as you want, move as slow as you want. Who cares? There's food everywhere and everyone's too small to hurt you. Life is good. Think about it. All the filter feeders today are bigger than their active predator relatives. Basking shark compared to a great white shark, blue whale compared to an orca, slip is the way to go. Other lineages took note as well, like the cephalopods, who really got their footing in the Ordovician. The most well-known Ordovician cephalopods are the orthocones, ones with straight cone-like shells. If you've been to any stores for rocks or crystals or fossils or oddities, you've probably seen Orthoceras fossils alongside the trilobites, they are unbelievably abundant. And they had relatives that got much larger than ever before, like Endoceras or Camaroceras, previously two separate species, possibly the same. We're gonna group them together as Endoceras to keep it simple, keep it quick. Big cephalopods with a big straight shell that could get to 18 feet long, dude. They are the largest orthocone cephalopods to ever exist that we know of. Unsurprisingly, a lot of our understanding of endoceras has changed since they were first discovered in the 1800s, as it usually goes. Early estimates put their maximum length at 30 feet long based on a shell that was reported to be that big and then was apparently destroyed somehow, but no other shells that long have been found. So for now, their max length is 18 feet long. Maybe one will be found in the future and not be destroyed, but for now, it is what it is. As you would probably guess, most if not all of the information we have about them is based on their shells, since their soft bodies didn't fossilize. This has led to a lot of presumed characteristics based on their living relatives of similar size, the giant squid. So based on their size, they were initially thought to be apex predators of the Ordovician, using massive beaks to break through the shells of other orthocones and trilobites and arthropods, tearing shit up like nobody's business. But a deeper look into their shells tells a different story. It suggests they were slow moving, oriented horizontally in the water column, and they swam horizontally. They were also widespread and abundant throughout the Ordovician period. They seemingly played kind of the same role as Agyrocassis filter feeders, taking advantage of the all-you-can-eat buffet. This may seem like a jump given the active predatory lifestyles of giant squid today and other shallow water squids and octopuses, which are again, mainly active predators. But exploring the deep oceans has allowed humans to understand that not all cephalopods 
do that. Exploring the deep oceans has introduced us to some just little guys that just trap plankton with some sort of mucus wet or like the vampire squid that just feeds on marine snow, literally just hangs out. So there's reason to believe Endoceras was just hanging out too. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. I kept talking about these new fearsome predators everybody had to adapt to and shit. Armor on fish, finds and weapons on trilobites. The ever dismissive lock and roll. What were their formidable foe? Sea scorpions, objectively horrific, objectively godforsaken. Objective, <clears throat> whatever. This period marks the beginning of the rise of the Eurypterids, the scientific term for sea scorpions, because they technically weren't true scorpions, just more distant relatives to the ones we know today. But they sure did look like fucking scorpions, and I'm gonna argue they were much, much worse. Because while the sea scorpions of the Ordovician, like Pentacopterus, got to a measly six feet long, others in later periods would become the biggest arthropods to ever exist, that we know of, and ventured into freshwater and even terrestrial habitats. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. We're gonna focus on the now. Pentacopterus is the oldest known Eurypterid out of the 250 total that scientists have described and was alive about 467 million years ago. They had massive, grasping limbs for trapping their prey. And fossil evidence suggests they got to about six feet long, like I'd said. There was also Megalograptus, slightly smaller at two and a half feet long, but hey, still at a length that would give me a heart attack if I saw one today. So a win is a win. They're most well known for those spikes that I don't need to point out. Coming off of their third pair of appendages personally seem a bit overkill to me, but clearly worked very well for them to find and trap prey, possibly located underground in the sediment. While sea scorpions lived on to terrorize the oceans for millions of years after the Ordovician, the vast majority of life at this time did not make it out. Like I said at the beginning, the end of this period is marked with a mass, a massive mass extinction that wiped out 85% of species alive at the time. The second deadliest mass extinction that we know of just after the Great Dying at the end of the Permian, which we'll get to in a couple months. You've probably heard that there have been five true mass extinctions in life's history, at least since the beginning of the Cambrian, and we're currently entering a sixth. So a true mass extinction is when more than 70% of species alive at the time die out in a relatively short period. So major events, very, very big events. So the Ordovician extinction is the first true mass extinction. And if I were alive during this period, I would have been fucking pissed the way this panned out. There were multiple phases of this mass extinction that had life bopping around all over the place. In the first phase, the earth got slapped with a global cooling event. Remember during this period, Gondwana was in the Southern hemisphere and making its way over the South Pole due to plate tectonics. That supercontinent, which carried with it an enormous amount of coastal ecosystems became engulfed in glaciers because of the cooling. This led to lower sea levels, which led to many of those shallow water and warm adapted species to get booted. This wasn't the end of the world because there were cold adapted species that were doing okay, or more generalist species that could adapt with the changes and made it out. They were chilling for a bit because that global cooling lasted from like half a million to 1.5 million years. Seemed to be smooth sailing. Nope, Earth got slapped with a global warming. The ice age was over and the cold adapted species got kicked to the curb, hung out to drop. Global oxygen levels in the water crashed, so anything left hanging by a thread got strangled with bare hands and spit on. By who though? What caused all this chaos? It seems as though the major villain in this scenario was actually the newly established terrestrial plants. A devastating shock, I know. These plants were interacting with the terrestrial environment in ways that had never been done before in order to adapt and survive. This means impacting carbon dioxide levels in new ways, weathering down rocks on coastlines that released different chemicals and nutrients into the ocean, which fed marine plants, which led to algal blooms that sucked up all the oxygen in the water. The transition of plants to land was a major event, which meant major effects that went along with it. While this initially had horrific impacts on the animal life that still only existed in the water, this transition eventually paved the way for them to follow them onto land, and that, is for the next video. All right, it's time to answer some questions I got in my comments on the last one. Can you tell me why my bedroom was invaded by ladybugs in November in Mississippi? Yes, ladybugs like warm. In November, it's becoming colder. So ladybugs go inside to seek warmth, to avoid cold in the winter, which sucks. I've only really experienced this once because in California, it doesn't get that cold. But when I lived in Minnesota to work at the big cat sanctuary, I lived on a farm seven miles out of town and my place was covered in ladybugs. Like hundreds lining the windows and shit. It was like, it It felt like the, it, it was like the apocalypse. It, it smelled horrible. Ladybugs, like they're really cute on their own, you know, just one at a time outside. But when you have them lining your windows in the hundreds or thousands, it smells like shit. It smells horrible. It smells like old clothes that were put into a compost pile with garbage and 
things that shouldn't be in a compost pot and they can leave like orange stains on stuff. It's just, it's, it's, it's unpleasant from the human experience. So they're kind of just like ants. They find their way in, you know? And so you got to use like pest control stuff. They're probably getting in through cracks and windows and stuff. At least that was the case for my place because the house was like 300 years old. So, all right. Next, what is your least favorite animal? Oh, it feels weird to have a least favorite animal because like everything's just doing their own thing, you know? I feel like the only way to answer this is to have a least favorite animal from actual experience, like not just the way they look or anything. And so I'm gonna say blister beetles. I dealt with them in Namibia. They have these like bright stripes all over them and any bright colors that I had on when I was walking around, they thought was a flower. So if I had on a white hat, or a red shirt or whatever, they thought it was a big flower. So they would come at you and then they would realize that you're not a flower. And if they suddenly felt threatened, they would spray this fucking liquid all over you that would leave painful blisters for like two weeks, which luckily never happened to me, but I know somebody who had a blister beetle land on her mouth and then she swatted it away and the blister beetle sprayed her mouth and she had like blisters all over her mouth for two weeks that were super painful. So that sucked. So I would say that's my least favorite animal. If you have a weird animal you want identified or a question you want answered, let me know in the comments because I might feature it in the next video. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it and to continue watching how the history of life on earth that we know of unfolded. Next week is time for quiz number three. This is the 10th video of this unit. So get studying, watch the other videos, we're gonna do a quiz, no strings attached. You can make it have strings attached if you want. That's up to you. And don't forget to check out the That We Know Of collection on Shopify, links in the description. Check out the Patreon for our Discord server and live streams. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.